people think that their house is their biggest asset. Well, in actual fact, their biggest asset is their ability to work. That's James Cameron, employment lawyer and partner at Raven Law in Ottawa. He's our guest on this episode of Concussion Central, the podcast that changes the way you get your information about concussions. Hi, and welcome to Concussion Central. I'm your host, David McGuffin. Our aim on this podcast is to help you, the listener, navigate the often very confusing world of concussions, diagnosis, treatment, and more. And we understand that for those living with a concussion, the best way to receive information isn't reading material, it isn't online, it isn't on a screen. It's by listening. We hear you. So on this podcast, we'll be bringing you regular audio interviews with some of the world's leading experts on the many aspects of concussions. Our last episode featured Dr. Shannon Bauman, one of the world's leading medical experts on concussions and recovery. Today, we dive into the legal side of the impact of concussions on employment. And I'm really thrilled with the expert we have lined up for you today. Hi, I'm James Cameron. I'm an employment lawyer. I've been practicing law for 35 years. I'm a partner at Raven Law, and I really like what we do. We do a good deal of work dealing with long-term disability, and that's what brings us into contact with people with concussions. They often have insurance problems arising from their inability to work. So, I mean, just to to get us started, you're in employment law, and that obviously covers a huge range of different things. Um, But I'm just curious how much of your practice involves concussions, and and how much is that growing, would you say? Obviously, it can't be exact, but anecdotally over the span of your career. Well, we deal a lot with people who uh, can't work because of either mental or uh, physical uh, conditions. And uh, I would say that's become a much more significant part of our practice. And uh, within that, concussions are a leading cause of people's inability to work. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a big deal. I've represented quite a number of people with, with that unfortunate condition. And consequently, we've had to learn a lot about it. So I, what I'd love to do is sort of work through some scenarios. But I'm, just first off, what, what, when do people with concussions tend to come to you as an employment lawyer? Well, the, the sad reality is that they tend to come to us a little late in the game. Mm-hmm. They tend to come to us when they uh, are turned down for one of two things. Mm -hmm. They'd either be turned down for proper accommodation by their employer, Mm -hmm. uh, if they are able to work, at least in some capacity, or they also get turned down by the long-term disability insurer when they can't work at all. Right. So when should they be coming then? (laughs) Well, in an ideal world, they'd actually consult us ahead of time. (laughs) Yeah. they, They might get some advice that might make it uh, make them successful in their mm-hmm. uh, request for accommodation or or disability uh, payments. So in an ideal world, that's what would happen. Uh, in in the real world, uh, that happens very infrequently. Yeah. So let's say I've I've had a concussion. I trip climbing the basement stairs and bang my head, and it's uh, you know I've been out of commission now for three weeks, and I've run through my vacation time and I've run through my sick leave, and my office is bugging me to come back and. I don't really feel up to coming back just yet, certainly not on a full-time basis. Um, so what advice, if I come to you, what advice would you have for me at that point? I think the advice I would be giving you would be to uh, get the very best medical advice that you can, uh, that you can get mm-hmm. and to pay close attention to it. I think you should be focusing in primarily on your, on your health uh, before you start taking steps to get back to work. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I would be encouraging clients to uh, see not just their family doctor, but to uh, see specialists, uh, ideally concussion specialists, about whether they are in fact ready to go back to work, or, and if so, on what basis or with what uh, accommodations, or whether they're better to stay away from work until their health uh, improves. Okay, but where where do you come in then? Say, I'm still getting pushback from my boss. He's saying, "Look, you know, it seems like you're doing a lot better. You know, we really need you here. We're, you know, we're understaffed. This is a busy time of year for us." And there's sort of a dangling thread of you know having to let you go. I mean, w- what point are you, are you getting involved, and what can you do to help? If somebody's coming in to see us and they're getting a lot of pressure from the employer, as I say, we'd be encouraging people to get uh, medical 
advice mm-hmm. as to their condition and right. their, their ability to go back to work. If if that advice was that they should not be going back to work and the client was still getting a lot of pushback from the employer, mm-hmm. uh, at that point we might be given instructions to write to the employer to suggest that you know maybe it's <laughs> time to back off a bit and let uh, and to pay attention to what the doctors have to say. So under employment law, what kind of protections do people have in that kind of scenario? Well, the employers are are not permitted to discriminate against people on the basis of uh, illness. And most employers don't do that. But they're they're frequently ill-informed as opposed to being in bad faith. Mm -hmm. And the problem, of course, (laughs) with concussions is that you look like you're you're fine. Right. It's not like you're, you've got a cast or you're wearing a neck brace. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you have to educate employers frequently about uh, both the condition and their obligations to provide suitable accommodation. Are there scenarios or are there clients that you've had, to give us an example of a client situation that you've dealt with that you know maybe has been difficult, but you've been able to help them out? Uh, sure. Obviously, I won't mention names and I won't give fact situations that would enable people to identify who Mm -hmm. we're we're acting for. But I've had clients where, you know, similar situations to the one that you've indicated where there's substantial pressure to turn up or else there's a a threat that you may lose your employment. We have had to write to them, uh, to the the employer and uh, provide uh, medical information to them that, that our client is not in fact able to return or if they are able to uh, return, it's under strictly limited uh, conditions. And sometimes then we get into uh, exchanges with uh, employer counsel about uh, what the appropriate uh, accommodations might be. Mm-hmm. And so it's pretty simple if it's simply, I need a stand-up desk. It's a good deal more complex when the accommodation might be, I can't use screens, or uh, I can use screens, but only for a limited time. I need to be able to uh, lie down periodically, things like that. They, all of those things are, are not quite as easy to, to uh, take place in the workplace. It may be easier now uh, during COVID when people are largely working from home. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. And in terms of a scenario where, look, this is going on for months and it's clearly that you're not going to get back to work and we're looking at a long-term disability, I mean, what kind of protections are there for workers in that sort of situation? And can you, I mean, what's the process of even heading down that road? Sure. You know, the first issue obviously is going to be the, the, the health of the, the individual. So let's assume that that's being taken care of. Mm-hmm. But the second issue is almost always uh, financial. And I guess people get uh, accustomed to being able to eat. Right. And so there are some government programs that will give you some income short term. You can get short term benefits through, uh, through EI, mm-hmm. uh, sickness benefits. They're good for about, I think it's 15 weeks or so. And that often enables you to bridge through until you might be eligible for mm-hmm. long-term disability. Mm-hmm. Long-term disability is, is insurance that most people get through their employment. Right. Although some people have it, have it privately. And you have to apply uh, for those benefits. And there are a whole pile of forms that need to be filled out by both you and your, your doctor and sometimes your employer. Uh, in terms of seeing whether or not you meet the, uh, the policy thresholds. Uh, we frequently help people to be able to properly fill out those forms so that they get the, the benefits that, to which they're entitled. Right. So, I mean, both of those, I mean, if you're dealing with concussion, dealing with that kind of paperwork obviously is maybe not going to be the easiest thing in the world. So can you just talk me through the steps of, the, say, the short-term uh, short-term disability, the, that sort of bridging situation you talked about with employment insurance and what that looks like? Sure. <laughs> Sadly, there, there are a lot of forms involved. Yeah. Uh, typically, what, what's called for it would be um, you, you'd apply for uh, EI benefits uh, if you're unable to work. Mm-hmm. Um, you'd uh, have to append uh, Notes from your from your doctor explaining why it is that you that you can't work and that you have a concussion. When you get through the initial period, 
which tends not to be too too bad. It's they're, they're, those benefits are relatively easy to uh, to obtain. Mm-hmm. Uh, the much higher hurdle is getting approved for uh, long term disability because they tend to be private insurers, right. and if that's the case, they tend to be pretty uh, demanding in terms of what you have to show in order to qualify. Mm-hmm. And what kind of things do you have to show? It's uh, not dissimilar to, to EI, mm-hmm. uh, except the level of detail would be much greater. They're looking for concrete medical evidence, primarily, mm-hmm. that you are unable to work because of your injury. And I would say that very frequently it's the case that insurance companies don't put, give a lot of weight to family doctors. So if you are able to get a report from a specialist, neurologist, say, a physiatrist, uh, concussion specialist of, of, some, uh, of some kind, that's preferable. That will be given greater weight by the insurer. And then you, you're going to have to fill out forms yourself in terms of uh, describing uh, what your symptoms are and why it is those symptoms prevent you from doing what your, your occupation might be. I mean, what are the, I guess, the, the biggest mistakes you'd say that people make in this area when they have a concussion and dealing with employers? I think the first mistake, which is pretty common from what I understand from our various uh, clients with concussion, is uh, people, by and large, want to get back to work as fast as they can. They want to re- get back to their old life. Right. Um, and so they don't want to admit the severity of the issue. And they are living in hope that their condition is going to improve. It'll be better tomorrow. And it might be bad now, but it'll be better tomorrow. And so that's the message that they convey to their family doctor. And so then you have two problems that are compounded. One, you've got an over-optimistic client about what their condition is. They're not actually as factually accurate as they might be about what they're actually experiencing. And then they're telling their story to a family doctor who probably doesn't know a heck of a lot about concussion. Right. And family doctors are trained to be perennially optimistic. Right. <laughs> and so they are trained to encourage people to, to think that their whatever their illness is uh, will get better because there is a psychological component to to illness often. And so you've got this unduly optimistic client speaking to an unduly optimistic family doctor, (laughs) and the two produce a report that is completely ineffective in the eyes of the long-term disability insurer. So we encourage people to be accurate uh, in terms of what they're actually experiencing and to encourage their their doctors to be accurate as opposed to optimistic about what the prognosis might be. I mean, just curious. I mean, one thing working on this on this podcast we've discovered is one of the problems in the medical profession is there's no sort of coherent central strategy to dealing with concussions. And I'm just wondering how much more difficult that makes your job as an employment lawyer dealing with people with concussions. Yeah, it's really, it is quite difficult because the consequences of a concussion vary enormously. You know, we all know of people who've been told, you know, they get hit in hockey, they see stars, and they're told to shake it off, and they're supposed to get back in the game. Well, that may work uh, the first time. And then other people have a single car accident, and they never work again. Right. So, I mean, the range is, is pretty great. And what we're learning, and hopefully what doctors and lawyers and insurers and and employees are all learning is that it's potentially pretty serious and that you need to uh, treat a concussion seriously and to pay close attention to what, you know, the medical experts are telling you to do. Mm -hmm. And when we get to sort of long-term disability, just to go back to that, um, you hear of people having to be interviewed and it can be somewhat of a grueling process. And I'm just wondering how you can help in that process. Yeah, we, we are a little bit cynical sometimes about the process mm-hmm. that is followed by insurance companies. Uh, there, there, there are a bunch of difficulties. Uh, one of them is that 
there's a fair degree of turnover on the part of the agents. Right. Uh, the agents frequently know not a heck of a lot about uh, concussions. Their, their focus is on trying to uh, weed out uh, fraud. Wow. And that's fine. Uh, we're not interested in, in promoting fraud, on the contrary. But we are interested in getting people who are entitled to benefits uh, to actually receive uh, those benefits. And the problem with concussion is that um, because the, the range of, of symptoms is so great and because the prognosis varies a lot from person to person, mm -hmm. it's, it's difficult to, to get def a definitive diagnosis uh, short term. And so, yeah. It's, it is it is tough. And say someone is in the situation where they're needing, they think, to get an employment lawyer. I mean, what's your best advice on how to, to find someone who's suitable for them? I would encourage people to find a suitable lawyer the same way that they find a suitable mechanic. Mm -hmm. And that would be by talking to their friends. Right. Talk, talk to a mechanic if they know one. Who does that person recommend? Talk to support groups. Who do they use? Mm -hmm. You know, what's the experience being uh, with particular in individuals? What I would in strongly encourage people to do is not to use the same lawyer that they use to buy their house. Right. Because that's very frequently the only lawyer they know. They can certainly speak to that person about whether they know somebody who is a specialist in this area, somebody who's done this kind of work mm -hmm. over and over and over again. I think if you've got a specialist, you're very likely to be uh, given more accurate uh, legal advice, and you may save yourself both a bunch of time and money. Right. And do you have any sort of final words of advice for someone who does think they're heading into an employment situation because of a concussion? Yeah, I think I would encourage people to do what people typically don't do, which is to call early. Yeah. We, we may well be able to head problems off at the pass. Don't wait for a refusal. Mm -hmm. It's it, it in fact is a lot easier to get people to make a good decision right. than it is to convince them that they've made a bad decision. Right. So yes, it costs money. Yes, it takes time. No, you probably don't want to have to see a lawyer. Mm -hmm. But this is kind of a big deal. Right. People think that their house is their biggest asset. Well, in actual fact, their biggest asset is their ability to work. Right. And if suddenly you can't work, well, you'd better try to get good advice on how to protect that asset. Yeah. I mean, I think that I have not dealt with the concussion in this way, but you know, just having the times I've had to hire a lawyer, that sort of initial consultation isn't necessarily a huge amount of money. And I've always found that one hour consultation can save a lot of money in the long run, too. Yeah. yeah you want to get off on the right path. If you get bad advice or no advice, uh, you can start uh, getting lost in the swamps uh, in a hurry. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I would encourage people to reach out, find, a, find an appropriate specialist, and, and then listen to that person. Fantastic. Well, James Cameron, thanks so much for all these great tips and advice. And thanks so much for coming on the Concussion Central podcast. You're very welcome. Thank you for listening to this episode of Concussion Central. And a special thanks to Ravenlaw for their support of this podcast. If you enjoy Concussion Central, please do us a big favor and give us a five-star rating and write a glowing review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. I know it's a bold ask, but the way the algorithm works, that's the best way for these interviews to reach as wide an audience as possible. And also, remember to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. For more information on the work of Concussion Central, you can visit us at concussioncentral.ca. So until next time... I'm David McGuffin.